Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What an incredible passage of Scripture. Of course, you know John 3, 16, is the most famous verse probably in the Bible. Let's pray together, and then we'll continue. Father, we love you this morning. Father, there are things that we don't understand about you, Lord, but there are four things that you want us to know. You want every person in this room to get this. Me to get it, everybody else to get it before we walk out this door today. There are four important things in this passage that really, Lord, summarize the entire Bible. Father, speak to us this morning. I pray that these words in this text, John chapter 3, will get a hold of our hearts and our lives. Father, use this text to examine my heart and to examine everybody's heart in this room. And everybody who watches on YouTube, Father, we pray. And Facebook, Father, we pray that these words, not my words, but your words, will touch our hearts this morning. And Lord, make us see and hear what you want us to hear. Father, I pray that when we hear that and see that, that we will turn to you and follow you as our Lord and Savior. Father, and I pray that this message will go out from this church. Every person in Brantley County will hear this or something like it to let all of us know what you want us to know. Father, we thank you that you are still speaking today, just as in the days of old. The same words that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, you are speaking to us this morning. Have your will in your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, I want to give you four things. Now, let me tell you, everybody, I don't care if you're five or if you're 105. These are the most important four things that God is ever going to say to you. In this passage, this summarizes the entire Bible. These are his words. Jesus spoke these words. Listen, you've got to understand this passage. If you never read any other parts of the Bible, understand this today. Number one thing you must know. Brother Frank, we put slide one on the screen. Nicodemus' life. Nicodemus, his life proves being religious won't get anyone to heaven. We're going to talk about that. Let me read that again. Nicodemus' life proves being religious won't get anyone to heaven. Now, now let me explain who Nicodemus was. You've got to understand, y'all, if being religious was a prize, Nicodemus is, was an Olympic athlete of his day. He was a man of the Pharisees. He was a ruler. He was more religious in his life than 99.9% .9 of us in this room will ever be, including me. Let me explain. I'm going to get, uh, where's Brother Justin and Brother Dylan? I'm going to ask you all to come stand by me a second. I need, I need some help. I need to feel tall, so I'm going to stand up here while they stand on the floor. Actually, no, I'm going to stand out here and just let you see me really. Okay. I feel like a midget ever since <laughs> Dylan came, too. All right. How long, i got a question to ask you, how long before you're 70 years old? How many years? Between now and 70. i got 14 years. How many years before you're 70, Justin? 32. 32. Okay, who can add? 14 plus 32 is what? Somebody said it. 46? Okay, how many years before you're 70? 51. <laughs> Marsha, take me home or take me to Bayview. All right. All right. So how many 51 plus whatever we just said? What? 97. Okay. Are you planning to serve God the rest of your life? Yes, sir. Okay. He's got however many years he said. Okay, I done forgot. Okay. 50-something years he's got. Are you planning to serve God the rest of your life? Absolutely. I'm planning to serve God the rest of my life. Now, y'all, listen, I'm not kidding here. I'm not exaggerating. Take everything that this man's going to do for the Lord. Take everything I'm going to do for the Lord. Take everything this man's going to do for the Lord. Add it all up. 
we still will not do as much as Nicodemus had done. Do you understand that? Okay, he was the top. Thank you, brothers. I appreciate it very much. He was at the top of the religious works of his day. If you put Nicodemus on one side and all 12 of the disciples together on the other side, Nicodemus would have been looking good in the day. They would have been looking horrible. You know, they all had different things, issues like we all have. Let me, let me explain to you why Nicodemus was so much of an incredible guy. He had kept all of the Old Testament laws and feasts since he had been a child. I mean, from the time he was a little boy, he was in the temple every Sunday, the Saturday, on their Sabbath day. In, in other words, in our modern lingo, he would have had perfect attendance from the time he was a baby till he was a senior citizen. He kept up with his sins. He made regular sacrifices. I mean, there was no backsliding like we've all done with Nicodemus. When there was even a hint of a sin, he would go sacrifice a goat or a lamb for his sins. In fact, he kept the law so well, he became a ruler in his synagogue. You know what that means? At his local synagogue, when they wanted to know something about God, guess who they talked to? Nicodemus. Nicodemus, what do you think? He was the leader. When Nicodemus spoke, everybody listened in the synagogue. Not only was he that religious, he was a religious leader in the nation of Israel. He had gone all the way to the top. He was in the Pharisees. That was the government, by the way, right under the Roman Empire. They had the Romans in charge, and then right under them, you would have the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the religious leaders. It was kind of like the Supreme Court, the Congress, and the church all together. He was a leader in his nation. And let me tell you, he would have been the kind of church member any church today would have wanted. I mean, a very devout man. Y'all, Jesus Christ, our Savior, told Nicodemus to his face, what he's saying when Jesus spoke to him that first time is, Nicodemus, everything you've done up to this point is worthless to your salvation. Do y'all hear me? Everything you've done your whole life is not going to get you into heaven. What? Lord, I've been here every week. I have a lifetime of sincere religious worship to you. You see, Nicodemus had the same thing we had. He had a lifetime of learning about God. But he still didn't know God. Do you all understand what I'm saying? He knew everything about the Bible. He knew God. But he didn't know God personally yet. It was all just religious practice to him. Let me ask you a question. Could that be said about you this morning? God, I know about you. I believe in you, God. But I don't really know you. I don't have an intimate relationship with you, Lord. No, I know about you. You see, Nicodemus made a couple of mistakes. Let me tell you, we make these too. Nicodemus assumed religious activity and religious heritage is acceptable enough. He assumed that. That's a big mistake. In other words, Nicodemus would have said, wait a minute, I'm Jewish. I'm one of the chosen people. I'm one of God's people. I'm in, right? Let me, let me tell you how it works today. Hey, I believe in God. I live a good life. I'm kind to my neighbor. You know, I, I don't steal. I don't kill. I don't murder. You know, the really bad stuff. So I'm in, right? Somebody show me that verse in the Bible. It's not there. Wait a minute. I'm a Baptist. You don't understand. I am a Southern Baptist. When, when you cut me, I bleed a casserole. <laughs> Doesn't, don't all Baptists go to heaven? Come on, right? Show me that verse. It's not in there. Wait a minute, I've been baptized in the water when I was a little kid. Heck, I've even spoken in tongues. You know, that must mean evidence that God is with me. No, they don't, brothers and sisters. They are no proof that we are right with God. How many people are in churches this morning depending on our religion to get us to heaven? It is not going to get you there, amen? It is not going to work. Religious activities are no good to me unless my heart is right with God. The second thing Nicodemus did, he assumed something. He assumed when he met Jesus, he was looking for a sign that Jesus was the Messiah. In other words, he assumed supernatural events and things must mean God is there. Nicodemus assumed that. You know, he came to Jesus and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. 
You ever known those people that were always looking for the next high to keep us coming to church? You know, we go along and we go along and we're like, okay, well, if the music were cooler, I could come to Southside. You know, or if we were a little more hip, if the preacher would get rid of the suit and go cash, I could come. Or if only we only can sing traditional music here. Nicodemus was looking for signs. He was looking for proof. I remember going to Israel, and I paid $25. I could slap myself now. I paid $25 to go stand in the Jordan River and be baptized and baptize a bunch of other people uh, since I was a pastor there. I paid. Do you know what I got for standing in the Jordan River and being baptized? Sick, cold, wet, and that was the most disgusting water you've ever been in your life. The Jordan River doesn't save you. Brothers and sisters, it's a beautiful river. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. But I realized afterwards, Jesus was at home. I could have met him back there. Have you ever met Christians that have to have that next high? We're running from high to high to high. In other words, Jesus isn't good enough. We've got to have a high to keep us going. That was Nicodemus. Just because, now young people, listen to me. i got something to tell you here. This is good stuff here. This is from God, not from me. Just because you go to a church and there's huge crowds doesn't mean Jesus is actually being worshipped there. Amen? Watch that. When you get out of here and leave Nahana and go off to college, just because it's the cool church doesn't mean God is happy. Nicodemus' life proves being religious won't get anyone to heaven. Jesus told him that. The second thing that Jesus told him. Number two, second slide, Brother Frank. Now this is awesome. I love this. Jesus' answer to Nicodemus proves The salvation of my soul must come from outside of me. Do you all hear that? Is that sinking in to all of us like it sinks into me? Jesus' answer to Nicodemus proves the salvation of my soul must come from outside of me. There is nothing I can do to go to heaven. Does that shock you this morning? Wait a minute. You mean being a good person and all that? That's great. But Jesus is saying, "Uh uh-uh, that doesn't, it helps. You know, it helps us be better citizens. I don't have the power to will myself into heaven. Anybody in here have the power to put yourself in heaven? I want you to see you raise your hand because you are a supernatural being. Did anybody have the power to decide when and where you were born? You know, you're saying, like, I'll pick her for my mama. I'll pick him for my daddy. They're going to go out on a date, and you arranged all this, right? He's going to whisper sweet nothings in the ear, into her ear. Nine months later, I'm going to be born. Did anybody here do that? What makes us think we're going to control the next part after we die? We're not. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nobody in this room, including me, is going to heaven until God says you are. Amen? That is an attention getter. I can't control me getting in heaven. God has to tell me, yes, now you're going. Salvation is God's to either give to me or not give to me. All I get to do is accept it. It's His gift. He controls it. You know, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, Ryan Albright started working here at the church. You know, he's doing a great job. Anyway, he was getting ready to go on this big trip. Y'all went on to Ireland and Scotland. Was that it? And I told Ryan, I said, now listen, Ryan. You know, Ryan, y'all pray for Ryan, by the way. When you hang out with a broke down old preacher, that's not a good day, right? <laughs> We're having a great time, though. We talk about a lot of stuff. And I said, Ryan, have you made a copy of your passport? Ryan goes, huh? And I go, Ryan, make about five copies of your passport picture And leave one with your mom, leave one at church, leave one with a friend. He goes, well, why would I want to do that? I said, what is going to happen if you get to Scotland and Ireland and lose your passport? I said, I know you look smart and, you know, you're a nice-looking young man and everything. But when you go up and tell them you want to get back in America, they're going to say, where's your passport? I lost it. They're not going to let you in. I said, you're going to have to prove the government has to give you an ID so you can leave the country and get back in. Does everybody understand that? You know what born again means? Jesus said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again can also be translated into the Greek, born from above. Unless God 
gives me salvation and saves me, I will not be in heaven and neither will you. That takes me completely out of the driver's seat of my own eternity. That's exactly where God wants it. He has always been in the driver's seat. What happens to you when you die? Either you let him give you salvation and ask for it or either you don't get it. You know what? Hell is that place where people who've said no to God are going to be. That's exactly, that's all it's going to be. Hell is that place where God has said, I want to give you salvation. I got it. It's free. I love you. And people are going to say, no way. Leave me alone. That's hell. That's where we're going to be for eternity. Every person in here, including me, was born spiritually blind and spiritually dead. The only way we're going to get to heaven is for God to give us the antidote to sin. You know, I remember before I went to Africa one time, I had to, y'all, this is unbelievable, I had to get 19 shots in my arms in one day. Because you're going, they said, I was going with Campus Crusade, and it was a last-minute deal, and they said, go downtown in Orlando, and they're going to give you some shots. So I went in there, you know, and I figured I'll take a couple shots. I rolled up my sleeves, and the lady says, you got 19 shots to get today. What? I got dengue fever. Uh, you know, all kind of stuff. And then, not only did I have the 19 shots, then I had to take malaria pills the entire time. And then I got on the plane leaving Africa, and they fumigated the whole plane while we were in there. Man, whatever I had, they were trying to kill it before I left that country. Whatever we've been exposed to. Have you taken the antidote for your sin yet? You've got to have it to get into heaven. Saving your soul for eternity should be your number one priority before you walk out this door today. Amen? There is nothing else more important. Where you live, who you date, who you marry, all that kind of stuff. Making sure before you walk out this door and get on that highway that you're born again, born from above. Jesus has given you salvation. God has given you salvation. Let that be your number one priority. It's that important. You're, we're talking about your eternity here, brothers and sisters. Salvation must come from above. Okay, so how do I get it? Number three, Brother Frank, number three. Jesus explained the only way to heaven is to be born of water and the Spirit. Okay, now here's where it gets a little confusing. When it says I must be born of water, does that mean I have to be baptized? Okay. Anybody ever known anybody that got saved in the hospital on their deathbed and they didn't, weren't able to get out and go and be baptized. Did that person go to heaven? Of course they did. The Bible says we're saved by faith. It's a gift of God. Okay, so what does this mean when Jesus says, I must be born of water? Well, some camps say, some churches say, you have to be baptized to be saved. You know, it, there's plenty of churches that do that in water. Some people say, you have to have been born a little baby out of your mother's womb. Well, I've never known anybody that was hatched out of an egg. Have y'all? Have I, I mean, there's only one way to get born in this world as far as I know, right? Out of your mother, right? You know what Jesus is saying here? Let's look at Jesus' own baptism just for a second. What was John the Baptist doing when he baptized Jesus? The people out there were getting baptized. They weren't getting saved, but what were they doing? They were repenting. What Jesus is saying here, you cannot go to heaven until you repent of your sins and let God wash you with that cleansing water of his salvation. Personal repentance. Let me, let me explain real quick what personal repentance means. And this is where it gets personal. Personal repentance means I accept full responsibility for my sins. God, I did it. God, I deserve to go to hell. You know what, y'all? Can I be loving but blunt? Every one of us deserve to go to hell. I am as evil. I'm capable of as much evil as Adolf Hitler, and so are you. The worst person you can think about, anybody that won't admit that, that's the problem right there. That's what keeps us from God is saying, well, wait a minute, I'm too good to have to account for my sins. Brothers and sisters, when you get to the point where you say, God, I am so sorry. I'm asking you to totally forgive me. Cleanse me. Save me. At that moment, that water 
begins to wash in you. Does everybody understand that? That's when it finally happens. Do you realize most of us are too proud to admit how wicked we really are inside? Marcia and I laugh. We say, uh, you want to find out how evil you really are? Get married. <laughs> right, honey? We say that we're like, sometimes we're like two little Tasmanian devils that have gotten together. <laughs> you know? I can get so mad the fastest. Can't y'all? You know what I'm saying? I mean, somebody just says, good morning. What do you mean by that? <laughs> that proves to me. You know what? You know what my marriage has done and her marriage has done? It, when you're single, by the way, nobody to argue with. But when you realize marriage is like a mirror, it shines in your face. And you realize, man, I am really that ugly. Nobody say amen, okay? All right. <laughs> Do you know what this service is, y'all? Can I be honest with you? God is giving everybody in here another chance to repent. That's what this service really is. He's giving me another chance to repent. I've had to repent of some stuff this morning. He's giving you an opportunity to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm owning what I've done. Forgive me. And then once we repent, he's given us the chance to worship him for real. Love it. Washing by water means repent. Jesus said also that we're going to be washed by the water of repentance, but also we're going to be born by the Spirit. Now, he's predicting about the Holy Spirit. There's two kind of people in here. There's Spirit-filled and there's lost. People who have been washed by personal repentance have accepted Jesus as their Savior. At that moment, the Holy Spirit came in. And let me tell you, that's the best thing that ever happened. Salvation and the Holy Spirit, what a deal. That's better than any deal at Sam's Club in Brunswick they got going on right now. Salvation. There's people who have yet, though, to be washed by the Holy Spirit. How do I know I have the Holy Spirit? How do we know? You know what? The sins I used to commit start to not get so much fun anymore. That's how I know. I'm starting to be interested in the things God is interested in. Like prayer and Bible study and all that. If those things don't interest you, I would check, make sure I'm saved. And we start to think and act. We learn how to love. Have you been washed by the water of repentance? And have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? By the way, there's no guessing. You'll either know it or you're not. There's no middle ground with God. You will know if you're saved. If you can't say 100% sure when you walk out this door this morning, I know that I'm saved. I know that God's forgiven me. I know I'm going to heaven. I would let that be a red flag and start to check. Finally, number four, this is the best part. This is the good stuff. This is what Jesus wanted to tell Nicodemus. Let me tell you, this is the message Jesus has for you. Point number four, Brother Frank. This is where it gets good, y'all. Jesus tells Nicodemus that he is the proof of the depth of God's love. Jesus said, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Back when Moses was leading by the children, uh, the children of Israel out of Egypt, they got out and they started grumbling. I mean, as soon as they left Egypt, they started griping and grumbling. Finally, God said, okay. I'm going to withdraw my hand of protection. Poisonous snakes started coming and biting all these people, all the Israelites. I mean, cobras, whatever else they have out there, would bite them. And, of course, they cried out to God, and, and God told Moses, I want you to make an image of a snake and stick it on a pole. And when the people are bitten, they can look at this image, and you hold this pole up. They see this image, and they will live. They'll be healed. Brothers and sisters, we've been bitten by the serpent of sin. All of us. When you look to Jesus Christ, he was lifted up on that cross. When you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, immediately when you say, Lord, forgive me, Lord, save me, guess what happens? Your sins are clean. And you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is the love of God right there. Nobody will ever love you that much than to put their own son on a stick and hold him up so that you can live. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. You want proof that God is real? Look at Jesus. Everybody see that picture that somebody's done on the screen? That's the proof how much God loves you. 
You want proof that God can forgive you and God will wipe away all your sins and clean you and you can be the happiest person in the world? Look at Jesus. Want proof that there's going to be a heaven? Look at Jesus. Last night, Marsha and I were watching the news on TV and they had the most incredible story. And it made me think of this morning what I was going to preach about. There was a Jewish man on the TV. It was on the CBS Evening News, if anybody saw it. It was right at the end. There was this Jewish man. He had survived the Holocaust. I think they said he had been in 13 or 14 Nazi death camps and survived. He was 95 years old, living in Los Angeles now. All of his family was killed. His wife was pretty close to the same age as he. She was in her 90s, and she had to go to the nursing home. So now he's by himself. He's got nobody to take care of him. And so I don't know how he met this young girl, but he hired a 25-year-old girl, something like that, to come and live in his house and help take care of him. You know the really wild thing? This 25-year-old girl was German. And this 25-year-old girl, as they got to talking, this Jewish man, survivor of the Holocaust, and this German girl, her grandparents were Nazis. They were interviewing him. How can you two be like this? How can you forgive her like that? You know, her grandparents did this to your family. They killed your family. They were a part of it during the interview. The guy reaches over, the 95-year-old man. They're sitting there together on the camera. And the girl, reach, he, he reaches over, the 95-year-old man. He just kisses her on the cheek. And he says, I love you. And, you know, we were sitting there going, wow. That is forgiveness. That is love. That's what Jesus wants to do for all of us. That's why God sent Jesus. No matter what we've done, no matter the evil that we've committed... Jesus reaches over and kisses us on the cheek and says, Come, I will save you, I will forgive you, I will love you for all of eternity, I will take you to heaven when you die, I'll prepare a place for you, you can walk with me and be joyful and happy and have a purpose in this life. What a deal, y'all. Best deal any of us will ever hear about. Jesus Christ, the message of this passage that we all need to leave with is, I don't have to depend on my own self. I can depend on Jesus for everything. I can depend on Jesus for my salvation. I can depend on Jesus for my forgiveness. I can depend on Jesus to t for calling me to what to do. I can depend on Jesus for giving me a purpose in life. I can depend on Jesus to teach me how to love my enemies. I can depend on Jesus to be there when I die, to help me at the nursing home. I can depend on Jesus for everything. And if I don't depend on Jesus, I'm crazy. I'm shooting my own self in the head without Jesus. What an incredible passage, y'all. God is sending you a message this morning. The message is, I love you. The message is, I don't care what you've done, I'll forgive you. The message is, let me take you to heaven and let me forgive your sins. All you got to do is admit that you've done it and ask for forgiveness. That's it. It's that simple. Even a child could do it. What are you going to do with this information? The service is over. Now it's time for decisions to be made. Let's pray together. Father, we love you this morning. Lord, thank you for the greatest news any of us have ever heard. Jesus Christ can fix me. Jesus Christ can forgive me. Father, help us be willing to admit, all of us in here, starting with the preacher, I'm a sinner and I cannot get to heaven on my own attempts. Help us to admit that this morning, Lord. Father, help us to admit Lord, I need help, and I need you, and I need you now before it's too late. Help us not put it off, Lord. Father, help this altar be full this morning of people saying, I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I want more of you, Jesus. I want to be closer to you, Jesus. I want to join a church, whatever. I want to be baptized. Lord, help us to love you enough to get up off our feet and move toward you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your many blessings. Father, we thank you for this passage this morning. Father, when we have Jesus, we have everything. The entire message of the Bible in 17 verses, Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born from above, and he is the way to do that. Help us to follow you, Lord, never looking back. Lord, we love you, Lord. We thank you for the honor and the privilege of being able to call ourselves Christ followers, Christians. Have your will and your way during this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.